recording this meeting now. Okay. Here we go. And then I want to give everybody one or two more minutes to get in here just so that we have as many people as possible. And yeah, one one more minute we'll get started. And if you have questions, uh, type in, in the chat. You have a question, then I'll finish uh, my my point where I'm at. If you have questions in like general questions about uh, an assignment, something that's gone in the past, something you're expecting for next week, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, hold those to the end of class, and we'll try and have a QA session. My hope is that I'm going to answer a whole lot of your questions in this uh, presentation. But if you have a question about the particular topic we are on in the presentation, just uh, type I have a question or something to that effect in the chat. I'll see it. I'll finish my thought, and then I'll let you talk. It would be a good time for me to take a sip of tea. Because I'm expecting to completely wear out my voice <laughs> during this. All right, and then I would ask also everybody who... Unless you have a question, I call on you if you uh, could mute yourself. Yeah, just uh, I'm recording this, and I want to make it a nice, clean recording for everybody in the future. All right, and I assume everyone can see my screen now? Yep, okay. Let's go ahead and get going. And again, if you do have a question, let me know, and I'll finish my thought. So welcome to the Game Systems and, and Data Lecture. Uh, this is for week three, and it's covering all the information in week three and a significant amount of uh, what's, what you're going to do in week four. I'm also going to cover an awful lot of information that isn't necessarily uh, in the test or in an assignment, but it's really good information for you to know. I try and cover everything in the test just to make sure you reinforce the learning, but this is good information. I'm particularly excited about this class and teaching it because this is what I did in the game industry for 15 years and I absolutely love it. I'm passionate about it. I, I did this uh, when I was a kid growing up. I would hand draw spreadsheets to do game systems and I would take apart D&D &D rules and put them back together. So I absolutely love this stuff and I've learned an awful lot uh, in my time both amateur and then as a professional and I'm very excited to pass it along. So let's go ahead and get started. So in, as a summary of what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover an awful lot of stuff. Uh, we're going to start with some core concepts about systems and data design. We're going to talk about the roles of systems designers and what makes them unique and special. Uh, then we're going to talk about how we create systems, what goes into the systems we make, what a system is, what is a game system. And then we're going to talk about uh, data designers. Uh, what's the difference between a data designer and a system designer? What are the portions of things that they control and how do they do their job? And then we'll cover how you create good data as a data designer. There are, this is a field that's a bit mysterious still in the industry right now, but uh, I and other people who I'm, I'm totally leaning on have come up with lots of techniques to make data design an easier less uh, intimidating subject. And then after all of that, we will do a Q&A and go through any of the data RPG rules. Uh, the data RPG is a set of rules that was given to you in a, a document that may be a little bit intimidating. It's pretty heavy, heavy stuff, pretty dense stuff, but it's a system that you would find in a turn-based role-playing game. And it's broken down into little increments with full systems built waiting for the data to be implemented. And we'll talk about that after uh, we go through everything else because hopefully after we go through all of this uh, in the beginning, the data RPG is going to make a lot more sense. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first up, what is a game? I know you've asked yourself this and you've seen definitions and we've talked about that before, but people of different disciplines have different definitions of what a game is. For us as systems and data designers, games are a distillation of life. Uh, and game systems are what that distillation is, quantified and organized. So life is big, 
Game systems are smaller than that, but they're organized. Life is not. Uh, game data is the individual parts of that system. So the system covers everything. The data is what the fuel that runs that system. So system. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, sorry, I was having trouble joining the, uh, the meeting. It's asking for a password and I'm unable to join. Uh, you're in it now, right? No, I'm not. I, I, I have actually called it on a phone. I'm trying to join online now. Okay, does anyone else have that trouble? I'm going to pause my recording. I'm not going to stop it. Um, anyone else have that trouble? Actually, if... Yeah, it looks like some other students. Uh, Professor Fairchild, if you could privately message him and, and work that out while I continue to go through the lecture. I want to keep this, because I'm recording, I want to keep it on time. I don't think you'll be able to message me because I'm on a phone. So. Are you in the Hangout, in the class Hangout? I know, but I'll get on that. Okay, thank you. Please do. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right, getting back at it. System designers, what do they do? If you thought of game design as an old-timey uh, production line, like this pictured here, system designers would be the guy almost at the very, very beginning. What the system designer does is they come up with the systems and the underlying structure of how the game world is created. And the system designer is the guy that like fuels all of this. So in a game production scenario, uh, in early pre-production, it's you're going to have your creative vision holder, the person who comes up to the game, often an executive or an ad executive or a creative director or a producer, one of those types, and they have an idea for a game. They've been tasked with making a game about something, and one of the very first people they're going to bring on is an engineer to start laying down the functionality of how the game is going to work. They're going to bring on uh, an artist to start establishing how the look is going to work. And then the next person, very often, especially in larger games brought on, is the systems designer. Because they need to know what are the, how is the game itself, the underlying structure of the game itself, going to work. So while the data designer won't come on until much later in the process, and there are often times many, many more data designers than there are systems designers. Even some bigger games have only one systems designer. Uh, I worked on several very large projects, multi-million dollar projects at very large studios where I was not only the lead systems designer, but the only systems designer. And I had a fleet of data designers that came along later uh, to, to fill out the data for the systems that I created. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit more. Life is complex. Uh, and if you see in this picture here, this is a representative of just one small snapshot of life. You can see here, we have biological systems with trees and uh, air and clouds and humans as a biological system. And we have interstellar systems with the sun shining down light and stars and the moon. And then if you dig in, we have cars and buildings. Each one is very complex. If anyone's ever taken apart and put back together a car uh, or hasn't, you know, that is a very complex task. So all of this is very, very complex. And it is literally and practically impossible to represent all the complexities of life uh, in a video game. And we wouldn't want to anyway, uh, because life is complex and it's not fair and it's confusing and it punishes the good and rewards the bad and all kinds of things that we don't want to do in video games. So what a system designer does is they take all of the complexities of life and they distill them down into a simple system. Now this is an impressionist painting and you can see this is also a street view uh, but it's a very minimalist street view so you see here there's just a couple of streaks of paint that represent people but we understand that. We can see there's some uh, phone poles, there's some people, there's some buildings, there's a road, there's a cityscape off in the distance all from just a few smudges of paint. When you look at video game systems as compared to real life, this is a, how simple they are. Uh, the complexities of real life are never represented, never even close, and even the most sophisticated games ever made, uh, the, the true complexities of life aren't there. They're simplified down. And so us as systems designers, what we do is we take either a real world or even a fictional world that doesn't exist, 
and we decide what are the, the impressions we want to give of this world. Uh, the next thing we do as system designers, we translate feelings and mo emotions into numbers, and then we translate numbers into feelings and emotions. Uh, this is a very rare form of, or use of mathematics. When you think of engineers and mathematicians and uh, nuclear scientists and astronauts, they do a lot of math, but almost none of those fields in any way, shape, or form care how the numbers make you feel or care how you feel about the numbers. But in video games, we do. If a boss has too many hip, a boss character in a video game has too many hit points, that can be frustrating. Frustrating is an emotion. It's not a real tangible thing, but it's something the players feel, and we care about that. That's, uh, that's the important part of the game, is to make the game feel fun, exciting, challenging. Notice, there are no numbers associated in the real world with any of those things I've said. But a computer is completely driven solely on numbers. So what we do as a systems designer is take those emotions, those feelings, those big complex parts of life, turn them into numbers, and then tweak and tune those numbers to elicit the correct emotions that we want from the player. Now, what kinds of systems are there in games? There's a lot. And each genre of, of game has its own subset of systems that they do, and each game has its own system subset of systems that they do out of the genre, and some mix and match from uh, different genres, from different kinds of systems. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about combat, uh, because it's a, a really good, fairly complicated system that is in lots and lots of games. Lots of games revolve around combat. And uh, the way you do combat in different games can vary wildly, depending on the goals you're trying to get. But I wanted to just touch on a few other uh, systems, just to let you know that this we're, we're just scraping the, sur the surface of how deep systems can be. Uh, we can cover experience and leveling up. Uh, and this is an impression of how people in the real world uh, gain, like you're going to school and you're gaining in knowledge and experience. If we wanted to put that to quantifiable numbers, we do that somewhat in education with degrees and credits and, uh, and things like that. And similarly, we do that in games, but we can do that with any attribute. Travel, traversal, racing kinds of games, uh, speed, maneuvering, we can get into physics with those kinds of things. Again, not as complicated as real life. Uh, we never are in video games, but we can cover those with systems. Uh, equipment, loot, crafting, you know, if you've played Minecraft, and I assume everyone has, or a big RPG like Skyrim or an MMO, you've done crafting, and all those systems have to be created. Uh, they're not arbitrarily built of what objects combined together make what other objects and what the use of those are. Uh, those are all very careful systems uh, that are put together. Player rewards is a huge one. Players will stop playing your game if they don't feel rewarded and challenged. Uh, and again, those are not haphazardly put in. We build all those systems. AI is an entirely uh, other thing in and of itself of how you control and synthesize a human being or the representative, the impressionistic representative of what we want a human to do in the context of our game. Right? So, for example, if we, we have a fast-paced first-person shooter game and you're shooting at each other, uh, we don't program into our AI, are they worrying that they left the stove on at home? No, we, do, we take an impression and we simplify human thought down to, you know, point and shoot, run around, take cover, things like that. And that's just the, the very beginning of many, 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 many systems. There are more systems than there are games, uh, but uh, those, there are a lot of rules underlying all these systems uh, that are applicable and can, and can pass back and forth from one to the next. So, how we go about doing this uh, impression? Uh, one of the first things we do is we use attributes. Uh, everybody who's played a role-playing game, or even pseudo role-playing game, or a racing game, or a fighting game, uh, uh, should be familiar with attributes. So, what attributes are is we're deriving data from non-quantifiable sources. Uh, asking how strong someone is is a very complicated thing, and if you've ever watched any weightlifting or any track and field, or uh, like World's Strongest Man competitions, 
uh, you can see there that there's lots of different measures of strength. Is it uh, core stomach strength? Is it raw lifting power? Is it endurance? There's a lot of different ways to, to measure this. So what we want to do is quantify out what ways for our game are we going to do this, and we call those attributes. So then how do we get to these attributes? How do we pick? Like I just said, things, are, things get really complicated. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is break down our subject, the thing we want to represent from the real or fictional world uh, in our game world, into its smallest bits. So we're going to have three examples here. And actually in this one, I, I welcome everybody to, to go ahead and turn your mic on. And I'm going to ask a few questions. So we have here a wheelbarrow, a cow, and a rocket ship, a cartoon rocket ship. So someone, in, uh, could someone volunteer, turn on your mic, and tell me what kind of attributes we could have with a wheelbarrow. Carrying capacity. Carrying capacity, absolutely. And what kind of measurement will we do that in? Uh, newtons, pounds. Sure. Um, what about volume? Sure. Yeah, it could be cubic feet, could be cubic inches, could be centimeters, uh, could be weight, could be newtons. Absolutely. What are someone else? What What is another attribute that we could apply to a wheelbarrow? Speed. Speed. Absolutely. How fast does it move? It is an old wheelbarrow that barely moves at all, or is it uh, got really nice bearings in there? And it's well balanced and moves quickly. Great. What what else? Maneuverability. Maneuverability, absolutely. And I have someone else is about to speak too. I was going to say dexterity. Dexterity, yeah. How, how, how new is it? Okay. Absolutely. So yes, all of those and many, many more. What about strength of the handle? You put too much stuff in it, it breaks. Or comfort, like uh, you know, this one's rough on the hands and uh, hard to use or color uh, that's you know that could be used for something else there or strength and uh, durability if you put too much weight in it maybe this one cracks maybe that one doesn't there's many many attributes that we could apply to this and as a system designer uh, what we the trap we often fall into and the reason you see so many redundant games is instead of looking what they're at what they're trying to represent they look at what somebody else has already represented. Uh, so when you see the same old attributes coming through the games time and time again, it's often because someone's not taking a fresh look at this like we are. Uh, let's go for another example. What about the cow? Somebody tell me an attribute of a cow. Stamina. Moo capacity. <laughs> Moo capacity, sure. Moo capacity, it could be important. Stamina, absolutely. How far can this cow walk? They can't walk far enough, they can't get to the fresh grass. Milk generation? Absolutely. Uh, so if we were playing a farming game or a dairy game, you would want the cows with the highest milk production. All right, what else? You can go ahead and type them. That's good. I'll read them out. Meat? Yeah, yeah. How much meat is on this cow? Uh, if this is a meat cow versus a milk cow, and there's some balance you could put in there. Maybe tendency to shift into parallel dimensions. Sure. Absolutely. A sci-fi cow. Uh, could do that. What about some weird things like quality of manure for a farming game? Number of legs? Sure, yes, generally four. Uh, and it would depend on what kind of game we're playing and making for. Uh, writing skill? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could could this cow be ru ridden? Uptake? How much it eats? Food required? Absolutely. These are great. You guys are doing really well here. So as you're seeing, we're coming up with lots and lots of attributes. Now, if I told you we're playing a, a simple farming game and you get to milk the cow once a day, would we care how many uh, the cow's ability to shift into parallel dimensions? No, we would not. Now, if we were playing a science fiction game where aliens were coming down and probing cows, then we might, <laughs> you know, then it would be important. So at first, as we break down uh, our concepts to their smallest bits, in this exercise, what I would recommend to you as, as systems designers is don't hold back. The, the silly answers we're hearing, the kind of way out there answers, those are great. And those are the kind of things you want to break down as far as you can. Now let's do one last one quickly. Rocket ship. A cartoon rocket, silly cartoon rocket ship at that. What are some kinds of uh, attributes we could 
put on this. Thrust, velocity, fuel, what kind of fuel, fuel consumption, carrying capacity, absolutely. Air capacity, absolutely. You know, how far can they travel before they run out of air or do they recycle it? Uh, cost of it, absolutely, perfect. Crew capacity, yeah, man, you guys are rocking. So, yeah, there you go. So there's a bunch of examples of how many cows it can hold, yes. Uh, how many uh, wheelbarrows full of cows it can hold. How its ability to fit in a wheelbarrow while being driven by a cow. Yes, we could do all of those things. Uh, as systems designers, we create the world. Uh, we run it. It's our choice. Now, that is given we're beholden to the creative vision in what we're doing. So now that we've got this giant mess, let's look at another example. On the left is a somewhat simplified uh, version of, of human parts. And on the right is how we usually see them in video games. Uh, is that silly? Are video games dumb because they don't take into account your uh, gallbladder health? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that keeping track of your gallbladder health is not something that most players want to do. Uh, that's another one of those impressionistic uh, systems that uh, in life, life is complicated, life is not fun. We don't really care about gallbladder health in video games. And someone in real life who's having a problem with that would, but that's not really something we want to represent either, uh, probably. You know, there, there could be video games, a surgeon simulator or something that did, but for a standard RPG... Uh, hack and slash dungeons and you know hunting treasure kind of game for us hit points are probably good enough to sum up all of health uh, and that's why uh, we we have hit points you might see some games where they break it down a little bit more uh, like a headshot would uh, would recognize brain as being different than just standard hit points uh, sometimes there are heart shots in some shooters again you're recognizing a difference Sometimes there are hit locations. Uh, there was a really great game called uh, Bushido well, uh, quite some time ago. There was a sword fighting game, and if you got hit in the, the arm, your arm went out. You couldn't use it. Uh, if you got hit in the leg, your leg went out. You couldn't use it. So they broke down uh, those systems specifically for their game, and there's a very specific reason. They didn't do it arbitrarily. Uh, we try not to do these things arbitrarily. So we, we break everything down just like you did with the cows and the spaceships into our, our most complicated system possible here, and then we decide uh, intelligently for our game how we're going to represent this in the game. So then we simplify it even further to our little guy here. And we want to have some, uh, some attributes, right? And so for our guy, we're going to have hit points, strength, dexterity, and a few more. Uh, those are detailed out in the data RPG, and that's the example I'm going to go over. But for our little guy, we're going to just talk about hit points, strength, and dexterity. And at this point, uh, we want to say, well, what does that mean, hit points, strength, and dexterity? What do those things actually represent? Now, this is a great time to have already done your giant list. So when we talked about all the attributes of a cow, uh, maybe milk production or meat, we talked about that, or endurance. Maybe endurance is just a function of hit points, right? So here we've decided what are the, the detailed things and what are they represented by? So hit points, we're going to say, in our game, represents the health of your bones, your muscle, your blood, and your organs, and the other things we saw. Your strength is going to represent your ability to lift, jump, hold your breath, run, and some more things. Dexterity will represent shooting, dancing, throwing, and catching. Now, notice there's a, little, there's a weird bit here that's a little bit ambiguous. Running and dancing are pretty closely related, and yet here they're governed by different attributes. Why is that? Uh, whoever's mic is on, if you could please mute yourself. Oh, we got a lot of people. That's great. So what we've decided is that running is a function of strength, and dan dancing is a function of dexterity. Uh, and we decided it because I said so. Uh, I'm the systems designer. I decided that's how I want it to work, and that's how it's going to work. Uh, in the same way that an impressionistic painter says uh, that, that one brown line with a little brown line above it is a telephone pole, 
therefore it is. Uh, we as system designers are the same way. Uh, and we can we can break it up uh, in any any way we want. But I have decided for our game that if someone has a really high strength, they can run well. And if they have a low strength, they can't run well. If they have a high dexterity but a low strength, they still can't run well, but they can dance well. So that's my decision as a systems designer. And I get to make that decision. But doing an exercise this like this where I categorize these things is going to inform those decisions. And then later on down the line, like let's say this is a role-playing game, uh, like a Grand Theft Auto, you know, everything in the kitchen sink thrown in kind of game, and there's a dancing mini game. And we don't know, some characters should do better, others should do worse, and you can increase some attribute to do better. And they would say, well, which one are we going to cover it from? Me as a systems designer, it's like, well, I've already planned this out. It's dexterity. So having that big list uh, and then categorizing it up, we don't have to calculate a shooting score, a dancing score, a throwing score, a catching score, if we don't want to. Because we have decided at what level of granularity we're going to build our systems. Next up, we've covered now most of the, the big stuff when it comes to, to systems. Uh, and now you've got all these systems, but notice something that we haven't uh, even mentioned once, and that's numbers. Uh, so we say we have to break everything down to numbers, but we've just been talking about attributes, not the numbers of those attributes. So that's where data comes in, and this is the key difference between uh, data and systems. Data is what populates and runs the systems. Systems cover all instances, so all cows have the same system. All cows have milk production. All cows eat grass at some volume. All cows have some stamina. And then our data determines which cows are better at milk production, have more stamina, eat more grass. So that's the difference between systems and data. And to break it out a little bit further, we have some things that uh, a systems designer will do versus what a data designer will do. A systems designer will determine characters have hit points, strength, dexterity, weapons, and armor, uh, like we've already discussed. The data designer will come back in then and say, okay, we got those things. Now there's a character named Ichabod, and he's going to have 98 hit points, 14 st strength, 23 dexterity, sword with his own attributes and numbers, and armor with its own attributes and numbers, which uh, we'll get into a little bit later. But uh, the point being, uh, the systems designer generally does not deal with the number. It deal, he deals with the interactions. The data designer is the guy that deals with the individual numbers. So now we've discussed how to build good systems, how to distill life down into uh, attributes, and then what to hand off to a data designer. And very often the systems designer is the data designer, especially on smaller games. So now we've handed the systems off to a data designer, and we need to make good data. So there's some also some good rules for making good data that we need to observe uh, when creating games. And again, games are different, and we have different purposes. Three rules that kind of govern uh, the making of your numbers when we actually get to making numbers uh, is smaller numbers are easier for players to comprehend. One is bigger than two. That's really easy to comprehend. The little children can comprehend that. Large numbers are more accurate. Uh, if I only had one and two strength, it would be hard to categorize 30 or 40 different kinds of characters uh, that are either one or two strength. That's not much granularity. Uh, so larger numbers, if I said one to a hundred, now I can categorize a lot of different characters with a lot of different granularity. Uh, a 97 is better than a, a, a 95, right? A 50 is twice as good as a 25, but only a little bit worse than a, a 56, right? So that's a lot more granularity. Uh, so larger numbers are more accurate. Fractions and de decimals are confusing to players, but not computers. Uh, you may be able to think of a, a, an instance, but it is a rarity that uh, you're, you're playing a video game and you get a, uh, you know, you, you defeat a boss or a character and you get some experience and it says, you have gained 23.825 experience. We don't do that because humans don't like that. Uh, and that's really the bottom line to that. I mean, it's, it's completely valid mathematically and numerically, but humans don't like it. Remember, we're concerned with the emotional interaction of humans with numbers, not just the numbers themselves. Uh, this is a very easy trap for young 
designers, myself included, fell into this of wanting to get very complicated systems with very high precision, and all of my players hated them because they were intimidating. Uh, so it's the player's perception and feeling of your numbers trumps the actual accuracy and beauty of your elegant system. And for an example, we have uh, three numbers. Number A is 94% of attribute B. Attribute A is 94% of attribute B in each one of these cases. But you can see uh, here in the first column, those are confusing, barfy, awful numbers that no one, most regular common players would not want to see. And I can quantify this because I've put it to the test when we've left debug stuff in video games I've made. We've had playtesters see stuff like this where we don't round off, and they're, they're done. They just stop. Uh, next on the list, 1617. I get it. That's easy. You know, third grader can totally understand this. 17 is a little bit better than 16. Move up a digit. Uh, so I get a little bit more accuracy. Maybe I need something in between. So I move up a digit. 160, because I don't want fractions. 160, 170. Yeah, that makes sense. 170 is bigger than 160. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's starting to get a, a big number. 165 better than 160. Yeah, I get it. But uh, you, what does that really mean? How much better is that? Slightly? I don't know. Uh, but this one, it's not so bad. And then we move up to our final increment. And this is silliness. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get 4879 is bigger than 4592 by but by how? Unless you showed me 94, 94 percent. I don't. I only. That's. I would think it was bigger. Just. I don't know. It's playing mental tricks with me again. And this goes back to psychology. And this is something that is shown. Now you may say, wait a minute. Uh, Peggle has huge numbers, enormous numbers that go across the screen. This fighting game I played gave me a billion. Uh, that made sense. Yeah, that's a trick. Uh, so that's called digit inflation. And that's take this number or this number, because these are the same, and just keep adding digits. So it's still the same granularity, but they're just zeros. And this is a psychological trick because humans most associate numbers with money growing up, and more digits on money equal good thing. So they're tricked into thinking more digits on points equal good thing, even though points only exist relative to each other in a game space. So if this was 16 million and this was 17 million, it's the same thing. All right. Now, how do we find the right value? So we've got lots of numbers. We've got big ranges of numbers to choose from. Here's a horribly boring, blah, uh, different uh, dictionary definition of what's called a binary search. But binary searches are magic, I'm telling you. These are data designers' uh, most elegant, beautiful method. And I wa want to walk you through it, and I, I hope everybody pays attention because I can save you, uh, if you go and do any systems design in your life, I can save you uh, many, many hours of maddening, frustrating guesswork time. Yes, pay attention. So if everybody is familiar with the game Higher or Lower, uh, it's a child game, uh, a children's guessing game. I'm going to explain it quickly, and then we're going to talk about how to play it correctly, because it, there is a, a right way and a wrong way to play higher or lower. So the game, uh, we have a range of numbers. In this example, we're going to say 1 to 128. And I'll, you'll, you'll figure out why that's that strange number. Uh, and the rules are, I guess a number, and then the, the person holding the number will tell me higher, lower, or correct. Simple enough. So, uh, go ahead and type in, uh, if, if everybody can guess, what number should I go with? 7, 64, 60. Any more guesses? 53, 58. Okay. One of you is correct. 20. Seven, another seven. Seven's popular. Okay, so I'm going to twist things on their head here uh, with, with the binary search. What we're doing when we're trying to guess the number is, uh, yeah, I'll get to that, Kyle. Very, very good. Uh, we're trying to eliminate wrong answers. 
Uh, most people think you're trying to guess the right answer. That is incorrect. What we're trying to do, actually, because there's way more wrong answers than there are right answers. There's only one right and a whole lot of wrong. So it's easier for us to try and get rid of wrong answers, and a lot of them, than it is to try and guess the right one. Now, how can we get rid of the most amount of wrong answers without uh, wasting time? Uh, the way, if we guessed any numbers, like say we guessed 127, and the result was lower, right? Okay, so we've eliminated one number, and we've kept... 126. Okay, that, that didn't eliminate many wrong answers. I could be doing this all day. So if we guess exactly half, then we know either it's above it or below it halfway, and we can eliminate half the wrong answers, uh, leaving us with the correct answer and only half the wrong answers left, right? So let's do it. All right, I'm going to guess 64, because that's exactly half of 128. The result, I'm told lower. Okay, cool. Uh, but I've already eliminated 64 of the answers, uh, of the wrong answers. Now, I want to eliminate more. Uh, so I'm going to do it in half again. And again, this says lower. So I'm going to do it in half again, 16. Again, lower. But I'm on guess 3, and I'm down to just a few answers left. Lower, okay, barely any answers left. I've eliminated 124 answers now just by the guessing a few times, two, four, five times, and down to two, and the answer was one, seven guesses. If I were to have guessed randomly, I could have guessed 123 times before I got it. So more than 90% of my wasted guesses have been eliminated. And when you're trying to hone in on a number, uh, a practical example of this is uh, if everybody remembers back when they were working on their scraps level and you had the little guy running around and jumping or any, any game where you jump and you want to jump up on a platform, but you don't want the player to be able to jump out. Uh, so you have a platform you want to, to jump on, but you don't want them to jump higher than that. Just make that. So you want to be able to not go under it, not go over it, but just make it. Uh, so this is one of many, many, many examples where we, we, we're, where we would use a binary search. Uh, you'd put in a really big number. Okay, that's too much. Half of that. Okay, that's too little. Halfway in between. Go up. Back and forth until you find it. And instead of guessing all day, uh, you, would, you could get in a very small amount. Now, what does this seem practical to that uh, you've been using this week? Yeah, that... that, that do the character sheets where you have all the numbers. Doing a binary search on the tough ones that you're lost, absolutely the best way to do that. Uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about a different method. Uh, this is actually not a method we're using in the data RPG at the moment. Uh, this would be a macro method for doing lots uh, of data, uh, where you're doing lots of characters, lots of objects, lots of different instances uh, of entities uh, that need to be balanced together. And uh, the reason we use this method is very often we need to compartmentalize things. What we don't want to have is uh, a ripple uh, effect of we make one change and now everything is out of whack. Uh, and that's a very common problem that games still have to this day. Uh, many of them because I haven't convinced them to use this method yet. They're behind. Uh, but you'll know. And then you can go out and take it and then games will get easier to balance. And that'll be a great thing. Uh, so this is the way we decouple instance balancing from system balancing. This is where the data designers and the systems designers work together and yet work elegantly apart uh, to make their data all balanced at a system-wide and an instance-wide level. So first we need to find the data range. Uh, and the data range is the acceptable range that we want to put our numbers in. And uh, what we're going to do is find first the smallest amount acceptable so everything has some minimum. To give a few examples, we don't want any characters with zero hit points, right? Even a rat has 10 hit points uh, compared to an ogre that has a whole lot more. Uh, even the slowest car goes some miles an hour. Uh, even the, you know, the, the least capacity spaceship for interstellar travel has some capacity to carry, right? We have decided this as system designers. Everything has a minimum. So we come up with that minimum amount. 
Next, we come up with what, what's the biggest. In our game with that rat with 10 hit points, what's the most hit points we would want? Uh, maybe it's that ogre when he has 200, right? That's a lot. So we come up with that number. Uh, and how do we get to those numbers? We do uh, some binary searches and playtesting. And we may need to adjust them later, so we keep that in mind. Next, what is the ratio? This is our playable area. This is what our data designer gets to work in. And our ratio is the max minus the min. And then we're going to have a, a ratio in there. So, for example, if our minimum is 10, we decided, like, let's say speed. That's the slowest we want something to go. And 40 is max. That's the fastest we want something to go. Then our range is max minus min, which is 30. So there's a 30-point range with which in all of our characters, in all of our system, must fall. Uh, and then our formula, you can see it calculates there so that we know where we fall. And if we take this formula a little bit further and plug some numbers in it, let's say our minimum, range, our minimum on our range is 10, so all characters will have at least 10. Maximum is 40. No characters will have more than 40, uh, giving us a range of 30. The, that's our play. And then this particular character is average, let's say, perfectly average, right in the middle, 50%. That gives us uh, 25. Now, in, that may seem confusing. People may uh, immediately think, well, 50% of 40 is 20. Why is it 25? Because we're taking 50% of our range. Okay, that's 30. So then why isn't 50% of 30 15? Uh, because everybody, remember, has the 10. So 50% of our range, 15, plus the minimum 10, equals 25. So the reason we do this is we can break this up into system-wide adjustments and data adjustments for the instance. The system-wide adjustments are the min and the max. Uh, and we'll, we'll cover that in just a moment. The data adjustments on specific instances are that ratio. So I can put everything into a ratio of quality and, that, and I can put that ratio as a universal number on any character, any instance of any character, object, uh, entity, and it'll hold. And it's all comparable numbers as well. And then a systems designer, independently, or myself, independently of those instances, can tune all of them together. Uh, if that seems a little bit confusing, let's go over an example. Let's say we're talking about run speed, how fast people can run. And we have an elderly person, so they're probably pretty slow. A well-trained athlete, probably pretty fast. A young, healthy person, probably fairly fast, but not as fast as a well-trained athlete, definitely faster than an elderly person. A young, healthy person, definitely faster than a lazy person. Lazy person, maybe faster than an elderly. A small child, like a toddler, they're like the slowest. They can barely stand up. Severely injured person, probably pretty slow, but probably not as slow as a child. Nearly superhuman. This is probably our fastest person. An average, okay, that's probably right in the middle. Now we need to turn these, these are emotions, these are feelings, these are uh, non-quantifiable statements. And now us as a data designer, as a systems designer, we have speed, right? So that's what we've determined. Now as a data designer, we need to determine what is, the, how do we quantify these? So if we use our data range finding ratio, We'll plug in numbers for all of these. So we got our average person right here at 50%. Um, and then we got our nearly superhuman 99%. Almost as fast as we're going to allow. All the way down to our small child, which, you know, they can still move, but they move at nearly uh, the slowest rate that we allow. There's barely forward movement. And we've determined in ours the severely injured person goes a little bit faster than a small child, but slower than an elderly person. We get to do that because we're the data designer. Now, if at some point we're told, no, 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 elderly people actually go slower than severely injured, right? Then we could adjust these numbers quite easily. And keep in mind, we have no idea what the actual numbers for speed are. These are all just percent ratios. And we can apply this to as many or as few instances as we want. And then the systems designer really without even our knowledge, can come back through and say, men's 10, max is 50. Okay. So, and this could be miles per hour. It could be uh, light years per second. It doesn't matter what they put in. Our ratios hold, and we do the math, and our numbers come out as our average person is 30. Remember, because uh, our range is 40. 50 minus 10 is our range. Divided by 2, 
is 20 plus the min is 30. And you can do the same math for all here. Now, let's say uh, you, you want to do that adjustment with a severely injured person, the elderly person. That you change the ratios, these numbers will change without the min and max ever changing. So the system designer taking care of these big important systems has not been affected. They do not need to retune every instance because you made a change. They work independently but work together and stay in balance. Okay, so now we've done some testing and we've had players run around in our game and they say, uh, 10's just too slow. And your whole game, your, your whole game, it's just too slow. I feel like uh, I'm running through molasses. I want, to I want all of these characters to move faster. And so the system designer's done tests. What they could do in an old system is go back and manually readjust each of these, trying to get them all back in balance with each other, and yet all faster so the player uh, gets through the experience faster. This would, this do, would, not only would, does, because I've been this guy, I've been this data guy that they said, go rebalance everything because we made one change. And, oh, man, you, you ruined my week. Uh, but instead, uh, using a system of range balancing, what we do is we say, we're going to change just two numbers and affect everything. So we've decided through binary testing and player testing, uh, we're finding our ranges, narrowed it down just right to minus 20, so double, and max is 87. That's a weird arbitrary number, but, you know, we found that number through trial and error. Like maybe if it goes faster than 87, uh, they can break our levels, right? Or they can ruin some other systems of how fast we want, or they ruin a frame rate. So we found the absolute fastest that we can accept. And you can see all the numbers automatically adjust uh, to the correct ratios without the data designer ever having to, to touch any one of the, the instances of characters. They all stay perfectly within balance, and the numbers adjust into real computer crunchable numbers uh, that use for calculations like miles per hour, kilometers per minute, or whatever rate, or whatever units we want to use. That is, again, independent, and we can uh, adjust that. Now we get up to next, we have all of those attributes, but all attributes aren't created equal. Uh, hopefully this, this image is familiar to everybody. This should be an assignment you've at least looked at, if not worked through. Uh, we're going to be using... Uh, some methods we're going to talk about right now. Uh, you're going to be using them to fill out this chart uh, to answer some questions that are in the, the test here or in your assignment and get these numbers to add up to the right amount. Now you notice there's base stats and then there's weighted and then there's total. And it, over in these weighted, you can see uh, there's two ones already filled out for you. Turn action points and the cap on your action points. And you can see the, the, the number we put in is 2, but it says 30 over here. And we put in 8 over here, and it says 160 over here. And 2 plus 8 somehow adds up to 190 total weight, which seems a bit weird. And the reason we do that is not all attributes are created equal. If we have a fighting game where there's not a lot of mobility, you're in a pit, for example, right? Uh, then speed is not very important uh, because speed... You can only go across the pit, so it's not that big a deal. And you're running speed, right? Whereas strength and damage output is hugely important. So if we had a character that was very, very fast, but he's always within reach, and he's very weak, he is not going to be balanced with a character that is very strong and slow. Uh, so the way we compensate for this is we do attribute weights. And this can be done for any attribute in any game, uh, and often is on, on every single big game with uh, lots of instances, whether these are guns or characters or weapon or uh, medieval weapons that are melee or spaceships or helicopters or cows on a farm, does not matter. Uh, anything that has different attributes can have different weights to those attributes. So what we've done here is we've shown you uh, these are what the value we think relative is to each, uh, to each other. So we think that the most powerful the most valuable attribute per point is toughness, uh, 30 times normal, right? And then we think hit point base, it's uh, not really significant. We want big numbers there, so the big numbers don't actually mean that much. So somebody with a really large hit point base uh, and a re really small toughness could balance out very easily with someone with a relatively slightly larger toughness and very few hit points, right? So 
Uh, that's why we do weights in games. These are something you expect to see every everywhere, and it's just a very simple calculation to uh, average out and normalize is the, the mathematic word, uh, very uh, incompatible numbers. Again, turning things that are computable readable into something that is designer readable into something that is uh, player understandable. Now, how do we get all of those characters in balance? Uh, I want to introduce you to what I call fulcrum design. Uh, this is a method I've used and other people have used. I've developed with other people when uh, we made uh, some very, very big games. Uh, there was at one time, I'm going to aside just this once with a small anecdote, uh, on a, a game where we had 45 different character classes, which is a very large amount. And each one of those character classes had 45 different uh, skills, different abilities to do things. Don't ask me why 45. It was not a number I came up with. Uh, but we did. And if you multiply those to each other, it comes close to 2,000 different skills. And each of those 45 characters needed to be balanced with each other. And each of those 2,000 skills needed to be written and, and coded. Uh, and even at 10 minutes each, that was over a week just to do one pass. So we could not, simply could not, physically could not uh, do all of that data work in the amount of time allotted. We just simply couldn't do it and balance each character against each other. So a method we developed on that game and I've used on many games since is called Fulcrum, where you take uh, one piece of data in our previous uh, example here. Let's say we take the orc, right, and we make him the Fulcrum. And we test the living crud out of that. We get him perfect. We spend a lot of time, way more time than we're going to be able to spend for any other character. And we get him just right. So that an orc feels good, and an orc feels good compared against orc. If it's a race, they race at about the same speed. If it's a fight, they fight to, to where it feels good, right? If they uh, farm, they farm to where they're both right in there, and they feel the, the same, and it's a balanced farming act, whatever orc farming is. But it's balanced. Uh, and then, from that point, once we have our data fulcrum set, we lock it. We carve it in stone. I actually asked literally on, on one of my games if we could carve one of the characters in stone and put it on my desk, and they said no. Uh, but we do that uh, figuratively, carve it in stone, and then every other character we make, we balance against that one character. So when I was talking about the game, I had 45 characters. Instead of 45 characters combined with each other, which we'll get to and see just how enormous that number is, uh, it was just 45 balancing, which is still a lot, but trivial compared to, to the enormity of balancing every character or every car or every spaceship against each other. Oh yeah, I already covered this. So yeah, yes. Uh, so first we design the fulcrum, balance each variant, and then we test the variant against each other. So when we have our orc and we test our orc against all other characters, the orc is balanced against all other characters. And by the nature of doing that, you will find that all of your other characters are in the realm. Even though your orc is balanced against your human and the orc is balanced against a spider and the human and the spider have never been compared they are within range they will just naturally fall into that range you may need some tweaking later on but a vast majority of your work is already taken care of you because you've made that center and worked around it uh, now doing our combinations to talk about the time saved and this is also a useful calculation uh, we're, we're going to talk about what's called the handshake formula and I want to show it graphically because it took me years to get this through my head and actually get a hold of it. So if we wanted to balance 20 characters against each other, how do we figure out how many combinations that is? This is a very common problem that we have to do as data designers. It's constantly we have to balance things against each other. Uh, so how do we figure out how many combinations that is? Or if we want to combine in crafting, how do we figure out how many combinations there are? Uh, so this is the method we use. And I'm showing you graphically on a chart that we can see 1 and 1. We don't need that because it's the same thing. It's not a new combination. 2 and 2, again, so this whole line, we don't need that. And then 2 combined with 1, 1 combined with 2, same thing. So we don't need all of this. So what we have here is the number times itself, you know, same number of rows, same number of columns. And then we subtract that number because you can see that middle diagonal is this, it's also 20, because they're 20 combinations number with themselves. So you subtract that number, 
and then you remove half. So if we do that mathematically, combinations is equal to the total instances squared minus the total instances divided by 2. And here's the formula. And you may say, I'm never going to use this. I guarantee you will. Uh, this is a data design thing. This is a formula. Write it down and someday, someday soon. There are other methods to getting to this. Uh, you can add up uh, my 20 times plus 19 plus 18 plus 17. You can do that too. That's a different method. But this is the most compact uh, method that anything you have to combine with anything else, you can Im immediately find out uh, the number of combinations you have to deal with just by calculating this number. Uh, and this also shows you some of the importance of the data fulcrum. Okay, next up, you have all this data. Be just a second, I'm going to have a little drink. Okay, so you've generated all this data, you've balanced all of this data, uh, and now you need, it might be, I could, uh, I could look at that later. Like I said, there are many mathematical ways to do the exact same thing. This is the one that made sense to me because I saw it graphically, uh, and it works, it's very combat. Uh, naming conventions. So we need to have naming conventions for things because at some point things move out of theory, and are actually on a hard drive and are in checked into a database in Perforce and you need to access them. The game needs to access them and you need to do it accurately. <coughs> so things have to really get uh, accurate at this point. So that's why we have naming schemes and also quite likely you as the data designer don't stand alone. So watch out for artists uh, because they name things horribly. I say just kidding, but I'm not. They really do. They're horrible. Uh, they name things whatever. They name things Bob with blue hair. Like, no, that's that's my barbarian class. <laughs> but the mesh is named Bob. Uh, they do this all the time. But not to pick on them too much. Lots of other people do it too. And we don't want to be them because us as the data guys, uh, the system guys can get away with some of this. But the data guys, we as data guys, things have to be accurate or they become a jumbled mess. So how do we name things accurate? Should be simple, right? No. It's the opposite. Uh, order compound names from most specific to least specific. This is the opposite of what we do in English. In English, you could say, I saw a small, small what? Green, uh, small green what? Slimy, small green slimy what? Alligator. Oh, okay. That was the important information I needed to know. An alligator. I was searching for an alligator. I don't need to know all the adjectives. So... What we do in English, we flip in reversed. So a big, fast, blue car becomes car, big, fast, blue. And there's a few pieces of information encoded into this. By me creating this name, I have determined the data factors that are most important to me because uh, maybe this car has an oil capacity and it has a wheel size, right? I didn't include that in the name. I only included the pieces of data that are important to me. Uh, and uh, obviously, by reading the name, you can see the data that are most important to me is that it's a car, first. Second, that's a big car. Third, it's a fast car. And blue, that's a fourth car. And in those order. So as data designers, if we create a name from the most specific that is most important to us as a data designer, and then dial it down to the least important. Now, an artist may name everything blue because they like blue things. Uh, or a producer may name uh, something fast because they like fast things, but that is up to us as data designers to enforce these rules across the board so that we don't have different naming conventions uh, and things are an entire mess. And as an example, you can see this clearly shows, I've got all my cars up here, got all my vans down here, because remember, that's the most important thing to me. What kind of vehicle? Car or van. Gotcha. And then my second most important thing, all of my big cars are here. So you can just read this uh, backwards. Blue, fast, big car, right? That sounds more like English. Or fast, blue, big car. A big, fast, blue car, right? Any of those uh, in English make more sense. But for us as a data designer, most important, second most important, third, and so on. Uh, you want to keep a, a limit to how big your names get, but that's really a, a practical limit uh, based on uh, what engine you're using, what game you're doing, the number of attributes, uh, the number of meshes you have, who you're working with. But this is more just a general, when you think about naming things and how you're going to name things, if you don't know, uh, start the opposite. What's the most important thing about that? That's the, the name. What's the second? That's the second part of the name. How far do I have to go? That's up to you. Uh, but it's as far as you can read, maybe as far as your data can display. 
Next up, uh, this is just a little quip that's just thrown in there. I didn't know where to put this. We didn't know where to put this in all of Full Sail's curriculum, so we're sticking it in here. Uh, and this is data validation. Uh, and But this is also part of being a data designer. If I sent out uh, a question to our class and I said, how many cars do you have? I might get the response to, that's great, because I can do math on that. I might get TWO in English. I can't do math on that. That stinks. A couple, okay, well, I know what you mean, but a computer doesn't know what you mean. A red one and a blue one, oh, that's the worst, uh, because you're describing things and not giving me the number. So all bad, good. Uh, we as data designers, we need to quantify things in numbers, because if I said, how many cars do you have? And I sent that out to everybody. Maybe I want to do the average number of cars uh, owned by people who take this class, right? There's no way I can do that with anything but this first one. Uh, and there's two methods you can do this. In Excel or any other spreadsheet, you can force validation. It's under data in the, the select. Select data validation, put it in there. Or if it's not in Excel, you can ask and enforce. Please uh, submit as an actual number, <laughs> a numerical value, something like that, right? Uh, if it's a validated list of uh, select which presidential candidate you want, uh, you don't want to get uh, Sanders, comma, Bernie, and Hillary Clinton, and Trump, right? You want, say, please select last name, comma, first name. So everything comes in the same way, and that way you can do tallies, uh, counts, averages, that kind of thing.